Let us pray. Gracious God, we, we, we need to hear you. We need to hear the many ways you speak to us, however they might be. Keep our ears and our eyes and our hearts open to you and to your ability to speak through each of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Who's the hero of the story? And who's the villain in the story? Or, you know, maybe if maybe not a hero or a villain, who's the good guy and who's the bad guy? I always want to know that. Every time I open a new novel or I turn on the TV or I go to start a movie, the first thing I try to figure out is who is the good guy and who's the bad guy, who to root for and who to root against. If I don't do that, the truth is I'm very likely to close the book or turn off the movie. I need to know who to root for. Most of us, I think, in life and in our stories, we long for that kind of clarity, for heroes or villains or for good guys and bad guys. Well, what we get today in our story about Balaam and his donkey is something that's far less black and white than that. In fact, I think what we get in Balaam, this, he's a non-Israelite, by the way. He's, he, he's sort of a prophet. And what we get in him in this story is someone who's perhaps sort of, well, does something good. He's sort of a good guy. He's sort of a prophet. He's heroic in that way. And yet, we also know, if you widen out your lens and you look at the rest of the Bible, he's considered a villain. What are we to make of that? What are we to think of this Balaam character? Good guy or bad guy? Or something in between? I think we need to look at the story again. So here we have the Israelites. They're just about to, it's the end of the 40 years. They're about to inhabit the the, the promised land, and they, they camp at this place called Moab, which is just across the water from the promised land. And the, the Moabites, the king of the Moabites, is frightened. He is really scared, with good reason, because the Israelites had just defeated, harshly defeated, two other tribes on their way. He was afraid with very good reason, and so he reaches out to this character, Balaam, who is a sort of a prophet, as I said, or the, the Bible sometimes calls him a diviner or a soothsayer, and he, he's from another tribe. He's not a Moabite, and he's not an Israelite, and, and this king of Moab begs him to come to Moab so that he would put a curse on the Israelites. The king offered him, and as it was customary in those days for these diviners or soothsayers, the, there was, a, I guess, a, some sort of a standard rate, so he offers to pay Balaam, but Balaam refuses to go at first. His excuse is sort of an odd one for a non-Israelite. His excuse is that the God of the Israelites, Yahweh, told me not to go. But the king is in a panic. He's not going to take no for an answer. And so he sends his men back, more, even more important men, and they offer him even more money. Basically offering whatever he needs and wants. And this time, Balaam says, Balaam says yes. His reason for changing his mind, God apparently was now telling him that it was okay to go as long as there was a condition on that, as long as he doesn't curse, and as long as he curse Israel, and as long as he does what God tells him to do, and say what God tells him to say. I can't help but wonder, with that back and forth, if Balaam was using God in some way 
is sort of a negotiating ploy with the king of Moab to get more money out of him. I don't know. Feels that way. Regardless, there's something else that is, I think, confusing here. Why does God keep changing his mind? First, God said, you can't go. Then he says, go. But just as Balaam and his donkey, this donkey who's, who's, who's pulling the cart, I guess, is they're on their way, God gets angry because Balaam went. And so God has this angel block the road that only that first the donkey can see so that Balaam would not be able to get by. Don't go. Do go. Don't go. Which is it? And that brings us to the part of the story that Sunday school kids know a lot better than most of us know, including me. This is an obscure story Balaam, about Balaam, but it's important. The part of the story is the fun part of the story because the donkey talks. What does the donkey say? Well, the donkey basically says what I would think any self-respecting donkey would do if they had a master who was beating them and threatening to kill them. He complains about his master. And so I'd have to say, if we're keeping score, so far I'd say that Balaam is not looking that heroic. He's sounding sort of greedy, maybe greedy, and definitely abusive. In fact, maybe we could argue that the hero of the story so far is the donkey. Because the donkey is the one who protects, who protects Balaam from this angel of the Lord who, I don't know if you notice it, but he's, he's got a sword there. And he basically threatens and said he would have killed Balaam had he kept going. The donkey saves him. And so what we've got here is don't go, go, don't go. What in the world is God up to here? Well, to me, this feels like God was sending a warning in ba ba Balaam's direction. Sending him a warning because maybe God recognized that Balaam might have been tempted to pocket the money and actually do the curse that the Moabite king wanted him to do. Maybe Balaam was afraid, maybe he was greedy, and God sounds worried. And so what better way to make an impression on Balaam than to have a donkey speak, that'll get your attention, and to have then open uh, Balaam's eyes so he can actually see the angel of the Lord standing there with a sword. That'll tell you that God is serious. Basically, what God is saying is, to, to me, what God is saying is that Balaam, you can go now, gives him authorization again to go meet that king of Moab. But this time, I got to tell you, I'm warning you, don't forget that you promised to only say what I tell you to say. To make this pretty long story short, Balaam actually does, he goes, he's authorized to go, and he does exactly what he promised. He doesn't curse Israel, but instead he beautifully blesses Israel four different times as commanded by God, and as we heard, I think it was the third of those blessings is what we heard in the second reading. And of course, the Moabite king is furious and refuses to pay Balaam, but Balaam sticks to his promise. Now, we can debate. We can debate, debate how Balaam comes off in this story. But in the end, it is clear that he's dutiful and he's obedient to God. Heroic? I don't know. But certainly, again, obedient, and he acts with integrity, living up to his promise to God.
I think it's fair to say that Balaam comes off pretty well by the time this story is over, this particular reading. However, and it's a big however, when we widen our lens and consider all, almost all of the other times that Balaam is mentioned in the Bible, in the New Testament and the Old Testament, that picture changes. Elsewhere in the Bible, Balaam is consistently, harshly criticized, especially lifted up as a man who corrupted the Israelites and enticed them into misbehavior, although no specifics are given. Revelation, at the very end of the Bible, goes so far as to say this about Balaam. He was a stumbling block before the people of Israel, causing them to eat food sacrificed by idol, to idols and to practice fornication. No details, just that. Twelve other places in the Bible beyond our story today is Balaam's name mentioned, and in 11 of those, it is harshly critical. And so... What are we left to think about our friend here? Even if he's not a full-on hero, is he actually a villain? What is going on here? How could a guy who was obedient to God and shows such integrity in our story become such a problem after our story, later in life? Let me ask that question slightly differently. Is it surprising that a human being might go off track after a good start? Or is it possible that a man might stop looking to God and lose his way? Are those things possible? Of course. It happens all the time. Uh, the Bible doesn't give details. It seems clear that Balaam lost his way after our story later in his life. The Bible was clear about that. Friends, you'll note that this sermon series is not called Heroes of the Bible. It's called Characters of the Bible. And that's because time and again, we can actually relate to these characters, these ancient characters who have very struggles, struggles very ancient though they may be, are a lot like our modern struggles and our modern complications as people. Time and again in the Bible, we get this realistic view of human beings who are complicated and have a lot of contradictions we do capable of beautiful things and not beautiful things, capable of doing good things and capable of doing bad things. And because of that, the Bible tells us time and again, it tells us, and I think this story today is telling us that we need God to keep us on track moving toward the good. And in that way, God helps us to be our better selves. And so in this complicated picture of humanity, complicated picture of each and every one of us, there is amazingly good news. Because we worship a God who is the ultimate story of the Bible reminds us. The ultimate story of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ reminds us that God is always ready to forgive us when we do go in wrong directions. And also, and we need to not forget this as well, also amazingly good news that for us to remember, because we easily forget this, that God also wants to work with us as people who have 
wonderful potential to do good, each of us, that's in us as well. Friends, we worship a God who is always reaching for us and maybe does so in some ways that are a little bit surprising, you know, like the, the talking donkey. Reaching for us to help keep us on track and to help us be our better selves. And because of that, it's, well, because of that, let us try to keep our, our, our eyes and our ears and our hearts open for the Lord in our lives. Amen. Thank you.